I'm Brendan Donnelly. I'm the director of the Federal Trust. And I want to talk about a taboo of British politics at the moment, which is any serious discussion of Brexit, and particularly any serious discussion of the possibility of rejoining the European Union. This is a, a surprising um, uh, taboo uh, for the main UK-based political parties to observe, um, given the narrowness of the result that um, took place in 2016, um, the obvious negative consequences of Brexit that we're now seeing about us, um, and the fact that, uh, according to a recent survey, that 47% of people still think that Brexit was a mistake, against 40% only who think that it was um, the right decision, um, and over 50% of people think that uh, Brexit is going badly, uh, whereas a, a very much smaller number, 14% on one assessment, um, think it's going well. Uh, you would have thought there were options and opportunities there for British political parties um, to make hay on the subject of Brexit, um, but they're very reluctant to do so. Uh, one can understand that most easily in the case of the Conservative Party. Uh, Brexit is the glue keeping the Conservative Party together, uh, and it's understandable that they should want to put across the idea um, that Brexit is a, a sealed deal. It's like the weather. There's nothing more to be seen here. Move along. Uh, and it must be said they've had a certain amount of success with this tactic. Um, until very recently, uh, a number of um, the public media, including the BBC, um, were very reluctant to talk about the consequences of Brexit that we see all around us uh, in shortages on the shelves, um, difficulties in petrol deliveries, uh, and in many other aspects of, of, of life. Um, however, the conservative attitude towards this uh, narrative has changed amusingly over the past few days. Originally, we were told that, for instance, um, shortages of petrol had nothing to do with Brexit. Now we're told that um, these shortages um, and the difficulties of Brexit uh, were part of the cunning plan um, implicit in Brexit um, to change the United Kingdom into a higher productivity, uh, high wage economy, which it hasn't been before. Well, we might ask ourselves, uh, why hasn't it been such an economy before? Uh, could it have anything to do with the conservative policies which have been pursued over the past um, 20 years, even uh, to, to a large extent un under Labour governments? Um, the um, economic liberalism, um, which has ensured that there was uh, very little in the way of enforcement of Labour regulation uh, and ensured that the British economy was something very different to, say, the uh, Dutch or, or the German or, or the French economies, uh, which were often decried by conservative critics uh, as being much too um, benevolent and uh, unsustainably um, generous uh, towards um, the workers, um, people in, in permanent e employment. Um, so that's the present conservative view. I, I don't think it's going to change. It's sometimes said that when fantasy and reality come together, uh, reality will always win out. Well, perhaps it will in, in the very, very long term. Uh, but I don't think there's much uh, chance of that happening towards today's Conservative Party. Um, Mr. Johnson's uh, suggestion that 5,000 extra visas should be made available for heavy goods vehicles drivers um, really is a, a, an indication of how far he is allowed to bend, um, willing to bend to reality. Um, 5,000 um, visas, even if you're going to be able to persuade 5,000 people to come, uh, is only a, a drop in the ocean. It's not going to make any difference at all. And uh, the much more likely course of conservative um, Mr. Johnson's reaction um, to the difficulties which Brexit is obviously causing um, is to divert attention. Um, and that's been coming about uh, over the past few days with the ramping up of the rhetoric on, on the subject of, of the Northern Ireland Protocol, um, which um, the British government um, uh, originally hailed as a great triumph. David Frost, its negotiator, uh, talked about it as an excellent deal. Uh, and now it's something which is presented in, in most uh, pejorative and most critical terms, uh, as if it were nothing to do with the Conservative Party that negotiated it. Uh, I think that's going to be the template for future relationships between the United Kingdom and the EU for a long time to come. Uh, I don't think this is a Conservative government interested in engaging in palliative dialogue um, with um, ways in which um, Brexit can be made, made to work. Um, and talking about Brexit being made to work brings us on to the Labour Party. Uh, until very recently, um, Bob Keir, John, Keir Starmer was very reluctant to talk about Brexit at all. He's begun to talk about it a little bit, uh, and he has two mantras. Uh, one of which is uh, he thinks Brexit uh, can be made to work, and the other of which is to talk of Boris Johnson's botched Brexit. Uh, I think the, the phrase botched Brexit is, is a questionable one. Uh, isn't it more likely that the Brexit we've got is the, ver the very 
um, inevitable and predictable consequence of the particular Brexit that Boris Johnson chose. Uh, and um, Boris Johnson's Brexit was one that Keir Starmer voted for and instructed all his MPs to vote for earlier in the year. I think a, a botched Brexit is a, is a, a nice phrase, um, but one which um, uh, will be difficult logically to defend um, by Mr. Starmer. Uh, his view that it's possible to make Brexit work may or may not be right, um, but he has very little in the way of concrete plans for making it work. Uh, he and his um, spokespeople uh, have ruled out uh, particularly any return to freedom movement, which rules out being in the single market. Um, and he seems vaguely to reassure himself and reassure the public um, that a Labour government, because of its uh, intrinsically more pro-European attitudes, um, will be better received by our continental neighbours. Um, I think that's, um, that's um, very doubtful. Uh, there was an interesting and illuminating remark by Baroness Chapman, um, who said that uh, it might be that in a few years' time, uh, British people were more willing to talk about trade-offs in terms of sovereignty once the toxicity had gone out of the present um, debate about Europe. Uh, what essentially that is to say is to accept um, that at the moment it's not possible to have a rational debate on the European Union, um, and the Labour Party certainly doesn't intend to disturb um, the precarious, of a, in some ways comfortable equilibrium um, of, of uh, a misinformed and um, a misled British public. Uh, we are often told that um, there's a, a, a contempt or a disdain on the part of a, a metropolitan elite for people in the red wall seats um, when they uh, uh, believe that their Brexit views are, are ill-informed or, or mistaken or even contrary to their own interests. Um, there's another contempt as well, uh, which says that uh, uh, the people in the red wall elsewhere who are Brexit supporters um, are incapable of responding to rational argument. Uh, the idea that um, we have to wait many years um, before the reality of, of Brexit and what it implies uh, can be explained to these benighted souls um, who are incapable of understanding the problems which Brexit is calling is, is itself um, deeply disdainful uh, and deeply contemptuous. The third, part, third party, of course, um, that uh, equally is reluctant to talk about uh, Brexit at the moment is the Liberal Democrats. Um, and their situation is perhaps um, even more surprising than that of the Labour Party. Uh, after all, the Labour Party did pretty well in 2017 when it, many people who were Remainers, who wanted a, a people's vote, um, voted for, for Labour in the belief that that was uh, the best um, um, choice uh, for redeeming the, the disaster of Brexit. Um, and in 2019, um, it cut against um, Jeremy Corbyn um, that he was so evasive on the subject of how he'd vote in a referendum. Um, but the Liberal Democrats have a tradition um, of being the most pro-European party in the United Kingdom. And they haven't really lived up to that over the past um, eight or nine months. At the beginning of the year, Ed Davies said that um, uh, the, Lab the Liberal Democrats were not a, a rejoined party. Uh, and in their, their autumn, in their spring conference, um, they adopted a, a, a party policy, um, which was um, to have as a very long term goal, uh, as Boris Johnson might putting it, uh, might put it, ad calendas graikas, um, to the Greek calends, which is never. Um, but in the meantime, they wanted to set up a commission um, which would improve relationships and uh, present um, ways in which it might be possible um, to construct a, a nearer relationship between the United Kingdom and the EU. Um, rejoin uh, was regarded a, as a, a taboo subject. This isn't simply in this uh, evasion and this reluctance to, to talk in the short term about Brexit. Um, the difficulties that the Liberal Democrats often have anyway in positioning themselves as a small party between the two big parties. Um, it's a view that um, somehow we can gradually get back into the European Union, which is quite widely held uh, outside the political parties by people who were active in the pro-Remain um, campaign in 2016. Uh, the thought is that um, the, the damage and difficulties of Brexit will become more and more apparent, and this will lead um, from the bottom up um, to a movement of public opinion, uh, which will call for closer relationships with the European Union, closer relationships that might well involve um, initially the customs union and then the internal market, and then hey presto, the British people will wake up one morning and say, wouldn't it be a good idea if we rejoin the European Union? 
uh, and then it will be safer and easier and more comfortable uh, for politicians and commentators um, to row in behind them uh, and say, uh, yes, that's a, a very good idea. We do, we do agree. We always thought so. Uh, I think there are three problems with, with this um, uh, gradualist approach. One, the Conservative government uh, and the Eurosceptic press um, are going to remain over the coming years um, powerful forces uh, advocating Brexit. Um, there will always be some new argument about why uh, something isn't the fault of Brexit, or indeed it's a good aspect of Brexit that certain, uh, on the face of it, negative co consequences are, are coming about. Um, I, I think the, the uh, ambiguous and uh, uncertain tone uh, of um, the people who eventually would like to rejoin the European Union, uh, but at the moment are, are too hesitant to say so, uh, will have a, a psychological effect on the, the British public. When you have a clear message about you wanting to maintain Brexit at all costs, and you have a, a mixed and uncertain message about whether you want to rejoin or not, um, I think it's evident that there's an enormous advantage um, to the, the clearer message. It's, um, it's difficult to believe that spontaneously, when there is so much political and media comment going in the opposite direction, um, that people in this country are going to come to the conclusion, we've got to rejoin gradually the European Union, uh, particularly if there isn't a, a clear um, uh, leadership, political leadership um, coming to support that view. The second difficulty I see is that uh, often quoted in this um, scenario is the idea that we would join, say, the customs union and the internal market uh, as a prelude to rejoining the European Union. Um, I think it's very difficult to see how that can be sold as an acceptable uh, course of action to the British electorate. Um, it was difficult enough. Perhaps it was made more difficult by the evasions of British politicians, but it was difficult enough um, to sell the idea of sovereignty sharing, um, joining the customs union, joining the single market and not being in the European Union um, is sovereignty surrender. Um, there is one thing which ironically the Eurosceptics are right about, um, that joining the single market, joining the customs union without being in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the European Union um, is a recipe for not being a decision maker, but exclusively being a, a decision taker. I can't see how this country, or particularly a big country, a big country where sovereignty is such a, a sensitive issue, uh, would ever be persuadable um, that that was an acceptable course of action. If you're going to make the case for rejoining the European Union, I think you ought to make it directly and not imagine you can do it, it by way uh, of granny steps. Uh, and the third, and for me, most, most compelling argument against this uh, is that it smacks very much of what has been a besetting sin of the pro-EU um, section of opinion in the United Kingdom, um, namely the doctrine of unripe time. Uh, there will always be a, a better moment, they say, to make the case for the European Union. Uh, until now, we will wait for events to move in our direction um, and we'll keep our powder dry. Uh, this uh, was particularly fatal in the Conservative Party. There was, um, 20 years ago, a substantial majority within the Conservative Party for a pro-European, pro-EU position. Um, and that was largely thrown away um, by the reluctance of the pro-Europeans um, to fight as hard and with as much conviction uh, as their Eurosceptic uh, uh, opponents. And then this indecision and uh, opportunism um, spread throughout the rest of, of British political society and was largely responsible for the mess that we got into now, we're, we're in now. Uh, it used to be said, I'm sure unfairly, about the Foreign Office that there were only two kinds of crises. Um, one crisis when it was, where it was too soon to know what to do and the other crisis where it was too late to do anything about it. Uh, I think that there's a, a danger that the same will happen, that there will be a postponement and a postponement and a postponement of making the case for rejoin. Uh, and we may end up, um, uh, as um, I've quoted already, um, postponing it uh, uh, and ad calendas gricas, um, which Mr. Johnson might like as a, a trope, um, but uh, that doesn't necessarily recommend it to me. Uh, another way of putting it is that we might postpone it until the 12th of never, and that's a long, long time.